Hello, good afternoon, everybody. All right, so uh, first let me say thank you for, uh, for spending some time with us today. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to learn a little bit more about what IPOs um, uh, really need and what is the undertaking before you come around to be able to uh, participate in them. And as you learn through them, and maybe if this is going to be your first time going through one, uh, keep an open mind, try to be able to take notes of what happened to the market because these things can be quite uh, tricky for those who are only experiencing it only for the first time. But like April pointed out, and, and of course, some of you guys also registered in your polls, uh, the long-term growth story here is very important because if you can see what the road ahead in the next few years would be for these uh, IPO companies, um, it should be able to give you better positioning into uh, understanding what you have to do and whether you should be aggressive, defensive, or maybe neutral into these types of materials. Today, I'm going to talk about the technical aspect of this. Now, in terms of technical aspect, this is a little bit difficult because normally technical analysis needs to review price charts. And we don't have that because it has not listed yet. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be looking at what IPOs have done in the past and try to see if we can prepare just in case such things happen again. And uh, given these types of conditions, I've prepared a few slides uh, just so you can see what uh, I have gone through in terms of the experience for IPOs. And I'd like to share this with you so that uh, you can incorporate this with what you're trying to do. And hopefully this helps you out. Okay. so. Uh, running through a particular um, IPO can be just a little bit tricky, like I said, and the reason is because um, when IPOs come out, it's normally the, the data that you normally get from IPOs would be mainly coming from them. And that means we're only looking at these companies for the very first time. And it's really try, difficult to make an assessment through and through whether a lot of the data we're looking at is, is good or not. But try to get what you can, and we'll try to hash it up. So it's really a, what I say, it's really a toss up by, and you have to manage this, but what you know about the IPO and what you've either seen about how IPOs behave in the past. And you somehow have to get these two things together and try to be able to mesh them together so that you can use this to, to your availability and try to make sense of all of that. Because the last thing you wanna do is be dipping your hand into a cookie jar, not knowing that there could be a trap there where you could snap into your fingers. So it's very essential that you have to first learn about what these IPOs are all about and try to see if that can help you out and make some sort of gauge as to whether these guys are good or not. Now, the one thing I don't want you guys to do is to simply guess, because guessing is not gonna get us anywhere, at any stable area. And if you're right in this one IPO, sometimes you'll be wrong in the next IPO, assuming you're just making a guess. So it's something that you wanna build more consistency on. And the more you know about an IPO, the, the, the better it can help you in making an assessment of it. So don't just you know, cast it off as if it or wish that prices would go up. Now, two things are, are very much important in IPO. So of course, number one is price. And I think April had uh, uh, mentioned a little bit about what the pricing of, of uh, IPOs come up, especially about Converge. And uh, a lot of things can also come smaller pieces that you wanna make an assessment of. To me, uh, being a technician, I really watch for sentiment because it's the only thing I can go on right now, uh, given the fact that I don't have any price history to be able to gauge for myself. But along with that, you will also ask yourself questions like, how big is this IPO? And the reason why the size of an IPO is important is because if an IPO happens to be very, very large, can the market take this? Or can the market at a particular time take it? Because sometimes it's possible that in a very, very uh, weak situation, for example, if maybe they listed this company uh, two months ago or three months ago when the market was just going down and down and being very dreary, I don't think everybody would be too aggressive to be able to buy it. So the size of the IPO can count because it's going to take a lot of that money away from the market. Second would be growth. We saw earlier on that the growth of this company, particularly Converge, is supposed to be moving very fast. 
of course, April said that, uh, you know, maybe when they were small and growing, that they have very high, high growth numbers. But when you have a million subscribers moving forward, uh, there's a big question mark. So like she said, the challenge will be on the company to try to see if they can repeat that over and over again. If they do, then maybe it will warrant the price. If they cannot, then that could be to some downward surprise. Story is also very important. What's the company all about? What, why, why them as compared to the other telco or broadband providers? What do they know how to do as the others don't know how to do? And you somehow have to see, do they have a niche market or do they have something that the others are not doing? And can they last doing this over and over again? Hype is another thing you also wanna hear about. Are people talking about the IPO? Do you see it advertised in any places? For example, if you talk about Mary Mart, when Mary Mart was coming out, it was an advertisements every day. I would see it on TV every day and psychologically bombarding everybody. And that picked up a lot of demand. And that's why perhaps it also did well. And of course, flows. What does that mean? I mean, is there a lot of money coming into the market at the particular time or is money very tight? Is there foreign interest or is it only local interest? So these things are all combined to put them together. So for example, if you have a good story, good hype, the size of the company is not really that big, good growth story. And even if the flows are not so big, if you have enough of this going for you, you could have a pretty successful IPO. And you know, even if you don't have so heavy growth yet, but if hype and size and the story are all together, that can really take a lot of mileage in an IPO. Now, of course, the heaviness of an IPO can also create a drag. And I'll point out some of that when I talk about some samples we have later. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about sentiment because like I said, being a technician, um, I will focus on this first because there's a lot of importance to me in terms of what this can do to an IPO. Number one, how is the sentiment of a market? Today, and only in the last maybe four or five days, the sentiment of the market has gone from a very sideways moving dreary market to a very excitable one. It's been up five days very, very strongly right now. Uh, people are scratching their heads around trying to figure out what's going on. But yet the, the bullish mood has very much changed. Now all the blue chips are starting to move. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we weren't seeing that kind of movement. The sentiment has changed. Now, how the fundamentals change? Maybe not entirely, and maybe it's changing in pieces, but the sentiment has uh, improved. So much so that if you were to look at the chart that I have in here, the, the index seems to be following a certain type of behavior that I was looking at earlier and I was really hoping for. And I was really hoping what we'd call a W-like formation as a base for a market to be able to portray itself. This is that particular W that I'm talking about. Of course, the first big down move, which came out uh, sometime in mid-March, of course, when we went on lockdown, major recovery took place after that, pulled back again, but made a higher load than the load that we've seen here. And now we see market breakout from the consolidation and move on. Now, when I was doing this, I was actually looking at another index um, as a sample, something that I saw back in 2016. Um, I used the German DAX or the German index as an example of what could happen to us in terms of similarity. So if you look at the image I have here on the right side, which is a German DAX in 2016, just look at it first and see if you can make the same type of comparison. Also, there was a big decline and then a major rally came in. If you notice, I also compartmentalize in colors, the rallies and reactions that you've seen. And after this, then prices broke out of this consolidation you see here and of course streak itself up. And so the W formation that I saw back then seems to be happening to the Philippines today. Now, if things continue to go the way I hope they would, then let's see what happened to that German DAX after. So the part that I showed you earlier was about this part over here. And you can see the rally continuing on. And after hitting the high of the rally over here, if you notice, the market did pull back for a while, but then exploded, continued to go up, and had one more hurrah before actually seeing some degree of a, of a reaction to the market. And let me show you what happened to this German DAX right after this. So this part over here is this part over here. And after this big push, which broke out of this range, 
the market really went up for a while, but then took some time and consolidated for the next couple of months. It tried to be able to reconsolidate itself because uh, there were things that it had to wait for. Maybe it had to wait for the fundamentals to catch up to the story. And then after that, the market just ripped open and attempted to move up again. So I think this type of situation could actually happen to the Philippine scenario. And the recovery that we might be seeing might be something called like staircase type of recovery, where you'd see the market would go up, then sideways first, up, and then sideways first, and then up again. Why not just a straight line going up? Well, because of course the fundamentals don't match that type of orientation right now. We're coming from a COVID situation and we need to be able to make better assessment of what's going on here. Okay, so given that condition, let's look back at the Philippine market. Now in the Philippine market, just to be able to point out that what I showed you in the DAX, the DAX made a big rally and it stopped a little bit at the previous high that it made. That previous high we have is situated between roughly 6,600 and 6,500. Now our index closed a few points just below the 6.5 level. So we are coming you know, coming towards an area where we might expect some degree of resistance, and that means some selling pressure might be enacted here. And so if it does stop and pulls back, there could be one more push before we might see that the market may need to correct either sideways or maybe make a re reactive consolidation similar to what you see here. But I very much doubt that this market will come back down all the way to where it's come from. If it does that, then we'll probably be in very big problems. So I think what will happen is the market should be pausing soon, but maybe it can continue a little bit while longer. Now, if it is extraordinarily strong for some, for some reason, this is what I would anticipate in terms of the high band, just in case a continuation would swing. What I did is I drew an uptrend line here, based that and I generated the price channel, and this estimates a potential upside of 7,000. So, on a normal environment, we should be reaching about here, which is about good enough. But just in case things happen to be able to swing a little bit more, it could extend itself maybe closer to 6,900 or 7,000 uh, as an initial phase, and then perhaps bank off into that consolidation or correction that I was talking about earlier. So I hope this helps, but it still points out that we are in a very different situation in sentiment because sentiment has improved and going back to IPOs, an IPO coming up in an improved sentiment time is of course beneficial for an IPO. Now in my uh, experience, I've seen a lot of IPOs come up and of course I've seen a lot of different openings uh, up and down. And I just wanted to be able to give you a sense of how, what normally happens into an IPO. That way you can prepare yourself and just in case it does attempt to manifest again, you know what to do and you understand why it's happening. So in an IPO, it'll go through roughly five phases. The first, during the opening, you'll either have a hurrah or a hiccup. A hurrah means you'll see prices just blast off and go up and of course, generate a lot of happiness on, on, on everybody's end. Uh, or you could have complete opposite. You can either see it flat or maybe even come down. I've seen even a very hot IPO go down and per, per, particularly because of its size. And I'll show you one in a little while. But normally after the initial phase of an IPO, whether it's up or down, it will go through a, a reaction, right? And after through that reaction, we go through a sell-off first because people are wanting to take their profits in case prices went up in a hurrah. They take their profits first, they wait for prices to come back down. And a lot of people will try to wait for a quiet period to get back inside. And so after a sell-off such as this, you will see some bargain hunting come in where a little bit more active people will come and daring people will come in to try to be able to try their hand in here. That will generate a bit of a rally into prices. And after that bargain hunting session, it will go to another consolidation or reactive phase called the accumulation phase. This is what eventually a, a new buyer or new buyers come in and they totally mop up the supply because they firmly believe into the storyline of the IPO, but it takes time to be able to do that type of accumulation. And then after that accumulation, that's when the stock will decide whether it's ripe enough for it to be able to blast back up into an uptrend or something wrong could happen. And that could, of course, put it back down into a decline. And I'd like to be able to show you exactly what those are through some of the examples. This is SM. So SM was also at this time 
when it made its uh, IPO back in 2005, it was the largest IPO, I think, even in our region. And of course, everybody wanted this. It was the most popular company in the Philippines at the time, and everybody wanted the stake into it. And the foreigners also grabbed a lot of stake into this particular company. Um, at the time, they listed about 250 pesos per share. Adjusting that for the dividends that they've given, that should that 250 pesos should be translated to about 135 pesos roughly today. And so the chart that you see here is this. So here's what happened on IPO day. On IPO day, the stock price actually fell down. Yes, so the biggest IPO then and the more popular one, it just couldn't hold its weight. The, the amount of shares they offered was just a lot at the time. The market couldn't bear with it. The foreigner just wanted to sell it right away. And what happened is that you had a bit of a de decline that had taken place first. Then a recovery took place, just a temporary one. It tried to go back. The, do the dotted line you see here is the IPO price. And then what happened is that prices attempted to fall back after that. This is the sell-off. So it had a hiccup, not a hurrah, because of course it was a sell-off, of course, it tried to rally one more time. Maybe the uh, maybe underwriters tried to see if they could protect this or whatever. But what happened is that a sell-off came back a second time, and this time the sell-off was more pronounced. And after that particular sell-off took place, it attempted to generate a first attempt at the bottom. Here's where bargain hunters came back inside. So look at this like a letter U-shaped formation. This is very typical that comes in during this phase. And then a major rally comes in and there are a lot of people thinking, oops, this could be it, the new push. And yet after it comes back closer to the IPO price or to where the high was, it banks off again and a big consolidation range is, is followed right after that, going through a new accumulation phase. So an accumulation phase means it takes time for a new person to come inside a new group of people to gradually buy all the shares that they can. Now, since prices are fluctuating in a band, of course, these guys who are buying are trying to get it at a better price. And that's why you will see it seesaw within this range for a while. Now, after that accumulation phase ends and everybody has gathered enough shares and it's tightened the supply, and that's the time when, of course, the stock price can finally move up. But mind you, this eventually moved up. And today, of course, you know, this is closer to 900 or 1,000 pesos per share, despite IPOing at 135 pesos roughly as an adjustment. But it took the company almost one and a half years to recover away from its IPO price before, of course, uh, jet setting itself up into that area. So here's an example of how pri uh, not only the price, but the size of the company during the IPO affected the IPO's performance, but took time, in, but eventually the growth story took control and eventually the stock price managed to move up. And we hope that's the type of situation that can come out in any big IPO that comes in that has a good growth story to talk about. Here, let's look at Mary Mark. Now here now we're not going to talk about a few years in the making here. We will talk about something a little shorter. On on the IPO price, which is way down here, which is a roughly IPO did one peso per share, shot up very very strongly, and after that went through a sell off as you did here. But remember the sell off that you see in Mary Mart did not go all the way back down to the IPO price. So that's fine. It, it allowed people to still be making money at the time. And thus normally uh, if you allow that, uh, the waiting time for an IPO to be able to resuscitate normally doesn't take too long because a lot of people are still uh, bullish about it. They've not really gotten hurt because of it. Maybe only the people who were buying up here may have had a problem, but eventually after a good time and a new accumulation phase is taking place. And I think we're still there today. And eventually as maybe the storyline comes out and enough shares have been accumulated, then we'll probably see something else happen for this. And the size was not so big. It was only 1.6 billion in size as compared to others that are trading, I mean, that are generating more than 15, 20, or close to 30 billion pesos in the value. Wilcon was another pretty good IPO. Uh, again, IPO price started about 505, shot up, did a hurrah, and eventually a sell-off did take place. It made its letter U-shaped bargain hunting motion and started to be able to draft an accumulation phase, which is a sideways type of movement here. And eventually, although you can see the consolidation roughly about the five peso range or today, we're closer to about maybe 14, 15 pesos in the share price. So this did very well in terms of an IPO. 
The size was about 7 billion, so not really that small, but not really that big either. And uh, things worked out quite well and still doing quite well relatively for this IPO. One thing also I want to point out is that in an IPO range, you could also check the initial price that they wanted to sell an IPO at. From here, it was 5 to 568, and eventually they priced it at the lower end of the range. Now, why does that happen? Well, sometimes it's because they have a hard time placing it at a very high valuation. So what they do is they try to make an adjustment. Normally, if that happens, people tend to be very watchful of a company. But uh, so like I said, the growth story is good <coughs> and prices can stay above their IPO price. Uh, that helps a lot in allowing things to continue much better. Jollibee Foods. Now, this also spanned a few years in terms of the data I'm using. But again, I just want to show you uh, IPO price roughly about nine pesos per share way down here. IPO day was just a massacre, went straight up, you know, didn't leave any room to, to buy anything in between and continued after a small consolidation to shoot up. But after that, of course, it went over what its uh, growth at the time was actually trying to do. And eventually it subsided to that selling pressure. Again, another sell-off, eventually some bargain hunting, the consolidation that comes in after the accumulation and eventually the uptrend that comes right after that. And of course, after this, the stock is closer to over 150, 170 pesos per share. And you can see how successful this guy was again, because the growth story came in to be able to resuscitate that activity later. Double Dragon, pretty similar to a Mary Mark type situation, also very strongly, and uh, also had a little bit of a sell-off. It also had its U formation, accumulation range, and eventually blasted off and went back up in a very, very sharp up move. So again, the pattern of behavior is pretty much the same. The only difference here is whether those issues we talked about, about an IPO, whether it's a story, growth, pricing, heaviness, uh, flows, all those things matter to be able to see whether that IPO day will be very successful and give you a hurrah, or whether it needs to take a bigger pause and wait it out for the fundamentals to catch up to the pricing mechanism that was uh, desired for that. Home. Now, the reason I wanted to show all home because um, people might contest it doesn't always work that way because all home seems to have just done a very flat movement for a while and then a sell-off came in, but look what happened again, still we had a bargain hunting move and now you're going through an accumulated base. Now, a little bit unfair for this as a sample because this happened, this big sell-off happened only because the COVID situation manifested. And it's because of that, that most companies fell anyway. All right, but I just want to show you that despite that, that the after effect will still bring a sell off, a bargain hunting move, and a gradual accumulation. So, what are we doing? So, the reason I'm showing this to you is because I think majority of IPOs, unless there's something very unique about them, will go through this process. And the reason for that is because when people go through an IPO, it is too widely spread out. Too many people are getting the IPOs, not too many of them have a very big position. If there are jockeys out there who want to be able to uh, ramp up on a particular stock, it takes them some time to be able to buy that. And that's why after the sell-off, they will only wait for the price to be a little bit more attractive for them to do that. And so the accumulation takes a while. So if you're going to be participating into an IPO, I mean, there's two ways to be able to do this. You could take a trader's mindset and you can take an investor's mindset. If you happen to do an investor's mindset, then I guess the, the strategy is easy. If you've fallen in love with the growth story, you go ahead, buy first a little bit, let the things that you know try to gauge how much you buy. But then after you see a sell-off and you see a bargain hunting, you can start to be able to accumulate again. And during the accumulation phase, I think would be the better time for you guys to be able to uh, pour it on into the IPO. And of course, put yourself up to what is more comfortable as a position you want to have in that particular stock. If you were taking a trader's mindset, a trader's mindset will be watching that IPO day very closely because a lot of people will probably just flip that stock on, on the opening bell or maybe in the next few days and see where the, the mania co cools down. The minute that correction comes in, you'll see that profit-taking wave come in and then you wait for that profit-taking wave to finish. Then if it starts to solidify and build like a letter U like this, maybe a shorter period of time or maybe similar to what you saw 
in like a double dragon, maybe something like this, then that's something that you want to be able to look at for a potential buy-in. And remember, you don't have to do everything all in one go. It takes time for these things to be accumulated anyway. So try to be able to make the most of that. Now, one thing you have to understand, remember, you can scale in your position. You don't have to put everything all in one big thing. But if you're unsure about an IPO, remember, you can always just try very little. And if it starts proving you right, then maybe later you can start adding and adding up to that position. If it starts proving you wrong, then either you hold what you have, don't accumulate first, and wait for that process I talked about, or you could sell it first, <coughs> wait for the sell-off to come inside until the accumulation phase comes in and you can always buy it back, assuming that the, the storyline still remains intact. And finally, if, like I said, if you're going for a particular trade, understand the mechanisms of trading. Trading, you have to be able to protect your position because in a sell-off, it's very hard to say how far down it could go. And so if you manage yourself by saying, all right, I only want to risk so much. If it goes below that, I'm out. And I will wait for the uh, U-shape or the accumulation phase before I get back inside. The whole point here is, you don't want to be able to lead yourself astray and lose so much money just initially. This can always be done, like I said, by scaling up. And you don't want to be regretting the fact that you decided to go so heavy handed into the IPO day. Because like I said, although a lot of IPOs, yes, they do have good days, but there are some IPOs out there that don't. So it doesn't always mean that you want to put everything on the kitchen sink into your initial IPO position. You can always build that in later. All right. So, uh, just to be able to get things done, remember, one thing you have to do, although an IPO is really an opportunity because a new company is listing for the very first time, um, you have to learn how to choose your battles. And if you know when to fight and when to stand aside, you will be much more victorious in that situation because you know how to be able to pick from what you feel is a more dangerous situation into something that brings much better opportunity. So I hope that uh, given this um, uh, movement and you've seen what IPOs normally do, that can best equip yourself to be very prepared for whatever IPOs that come out into either the next few days, into the next few months and years. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And of course, good luck to, to many of you.